Hello, uh, welcome back. I now want to tell you about uh, a common nonlinear behavior that emerges when you have friction in um, your systems and give a kind of a simple example and explanation as to why this uh, would um, appear. And the phenomena I want to talk about is hunting. And uh, hunting really can, is a phenomena centered around reference point uh, tracking. So let's suppose that we, we have some time here and we have some system and in the past it had been happily uh, operating along at some reference point and we now want to change um, our operating point. So we put a step in as our reference signal here and we want to push our system from operating in this region up to operating in this one. Uh, and what can happen if um, we have friction in our system is we may have been operating perfectly fine around here. Um, then we put in this step change, we try and change our operating point. It takes a little bit of time, so this yellow signal here, this is the output of our system. It takes a little bit of time to head up to our new uh, operating point or our new reference value. Um, we get close, but we sort of we miss it and then we drop down below and then we sort of keep missing up and down, up and down like this. And it's this phenomena that's called hunting. The output is hunting for the reference signal, but it never seems to settle down to the reference signal. Instead, it sort of seems to be uh, stuck in this limit cycle around the new operating point. Um, and this can be, in, this is one, one of the things that can be induced by having friction in your models. And I now just want to sort of talk through at a high level how we might explain um, this with the kind of describing function tools that we've seen earlier in the course. And I want to do it within uh, the framework of a simple system modeling, um, what's called a flexible servo. And now the details aren't really important here. Um, once again, this is not a course about modeling. But to give you a picture um, to go with this, uh, we have some motor um, that is driving some load and everything is rotating here and this load is rotating at angular velocity omega 2 and we want to control the angular velocity here. Uh, so this is our output of interest uh, y and we're interested in controlling the angular velocity using the motor and we can apply some force u with our motor, um, but there's also some friction going on at this joint here. So whatever force that we apply with our motor is being opposed by a rotational, yeah, these are, these are torques, not forces really. So we have some frictional torque opposing um, the, the torque being applied by our motor. And the motor is then connected to the load that we're driving through some uh, flexible shaft. So you can just imagine like a pole, but the pole's got some give in it. And a common way to model this is through a, a spring, uh, where the stiffness of the spring corresponds to the stiffness in the shaft. Um, so we have some setup like this, the torsional spring constant is K, um, and the motor here has um, moment of inertia J1 and the load moment of inertia J2. And if you go, th go through things and you write down the equations of motion, you get something that looks like this. So the first equation here, this is describing Newton's law when applied to the motor. So we have the yeah, moment of inertia and then the d omega 1 by dt. So omega 1 is the angular velocity of the motor. Um, this is the spring uh, force coming from this torsional spring. Phi 1 is the angular position of the motor and phi 2 is the angular position of the load. And so just like a normal spring, the force is proportional to the relative, well, the, the length of the spring. This is, the force is proportional to the relative twist, uh, if you like. Then we have some damping, and then these are the external forces. So we have the force that we're applying with the motor, and we have this troublesome friction force here. We have a similar equation going on for the load, so moment of inertia of the load, and then the, the angular acceleration of the load. Here we have an equal and opposite force coming from the spring, so k uh, phi 1 minus phi 2, and then we also have a damping term d2 omega 2. And then finally, we, we just model the connection between the angular position and the angular velocity because only the angle difference 
appears, it's convenient to just save an equation and, and write uh, go directly to this form. So this is saying the yeah phi one dot minus phi two dot is equal to omega one minus omega two. We could have a separate equation for both of those if we wanted. Um, but anyway, we have this set up here, and we want to design a controller to perform some reference tracking where the objective is to um, control the angular velocity of the load. Um, but we observe this sort of hunting behavior here, and um, I just want to sort of give a little hint as to why. Maybe you can already start to guess, um, given that our friction models looked awfully like relay functions. Um, so let's just draw a block diagram representation for what is going on here. So we'll just sort of start to fill things out. We'll start off by starting to draw this equation here. Um, and so after you take if you notice everything here is linear, so we can start to take Laplace transforms of things. And so here we have a friction force. I'm going to put a negative sign in here. Here we have the input from our um, motor, U. And these things all affect, and, and we have some other force here. I'm not going to draw it in yet, but this is the force caused by the angular difference. And what does that now drive? It drives the evolution of omega 1. And you take Laplace transforms, and you get 1 over j1 s plus d1. And so here we have omega 1. And I'm just going to start drawing some more pieces. And we're now going to start trying to model the second uh, the, the, the load. And so we've got something similar going on here. We have a 1 over J2S plus D2 that's going to give us our omega 2. So, And then what's the input force? The input force is just this K phi 1 minus phi 2. So it's convenient to draw a little negative feedback here. So this signal now, this is omega 1 minus omega 2. So to get k of phi 1 minus phi 2, we just have to put an integrator in and scale it by the stiffness constant k. And this now gives us the input to our second uh, mass here from which we, uh, yeah, to the load from which we can determine the angular velocity omega 2. And then you see also this force gets applied to the to the motor as well, but in the opposite direction. So if we put a minus sign here and we take this signal out and feed it back like this, we've now applied all of the forces that we needed um, to, to every object. So this is a complete description of this set of equations here. Um, and now all that's left is to add on our control system for controlling the angular velocity omega 2 and um, also put in our friction model. So let's maybe do that in some different colors. So for the control system, so this is our output uh, y is equal to omega 2 and now a sort of a standard feedback setup for doing things here is we would have our reference input here we compare it to our output, and this gives us our error signal. And then maybe we feed this into some kind of PID controller here, or we can design whatever controller we like. And how about the friction model? Well, last time we said the simplest models of friction correspond to uh, using a negative feedback that depends on the angular velocity, or the velocity we talked about before but it's the same in the rotational setting. So we could feed back this signal here, and here we have our friction model, and this gets fed back here. So this is sort of a complete picture of what's going on in this, uh, this setup. So we want to design our controller so that our output tracks our reference, but some, something about this friction term here is predicting the introduction of limit cycles. So if we want to use all of our limit cycle um, theory from before, 
what do we have to do? Well, we have to collapse things down and put it into our standard form. And that means um, that we've got to take everything that's not in this orange piece. So we have to take all of the feedback loops here and just collapse them down. They're all linear systems and just collapse them down into some nominal transfer function uh, g. And it's now just sort of a, maybe a slightly tedious one, but it's now just a sort of a, a standard exercise to go about doing that. You just close the feedback loops one at a time. So you should start by closing this, this feedback loop off and then you can close um, this one off and then you can close this one off or there's probably other ways to do it as well. Um, so you go and you simplify all of this down and we end up with our friction model. And here we have the friction force FR. Here we have a minus sign. And here we have omega 1. And here we have the transfer function G of S, which is the transfer function you get after you simplify down all of these linear pieces. And now this is in exactly the feedback form that we've been studying before for predicting limit cycles with um, describing functions. So we know what to do. Um, if we want to predict a limit cycle here, we plot the Nyquist diagram of G of S and we see if it in intersects the describing function for um, our model of friction. So what might that look, at, look like? Well, what you will find, and you're very welcome to go away and do this for yourself is maybe just set all of the parameters in the model here equal to one and try and design some kind of PID controller or whatever controller you like um, and find out what this transfer function G of S um, is. And depending on the shape of that transfer function, you may find that you predict limit cycles or you might not predict limit cycles. So a sort of a, a fairly naive design, a sort of a standard shape that you might get for your G of S is something that looks a bit like this. So this is the Nyquist diagram for G. This is omega is equal to zero sort of starting here, and then omega increases, 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 and tends to infinity down here. So omega tends to infinity is in there. Um, and so what you find, you put in some numbers, and this is the Nyquist diagram you get. Why might this lead um, to the emergence of limit cycles? Well, if we take our simple model uh, for the um, for friction, which was just our relay, we remember that the describing function for a relay looked like this. So this is the describing function for the relay. This is amplitude is equal to zero, and this is amplitude tends to infinity. And so do we predict a limit cycle in this situation? Well, yes, because we get an intersection uh, between our Nyquist uh, curve and our describing function curve. So the condition of harmonic balance is fulfilled. So that's g of j omega is equal to minus 1 over n of a, where this is the describing function of our friction model. And is it stable? Well, yes, it is. Um, g of s here must be a stable transfer function. So in the absence of friction, we would be designing a stabilizing controller. So when we simplify all of this stuff down, this transfer function here, g of s, is going to be stable. And now we see that if we have small values of a, we have a stable transfer function, we're making a clockwise encirclement, therefore we predict instability but for large values of A, we have zero encirclements. So by Nyquist, we predict stability. This was precisely the case where you predict the emergence of stable limit cycles. So small amplitudes unstable, large amplitudes stable. A cross of the curves predicts a limit cycle with this amplitude and this frequency. And um, so here we, we roughly have a kind of a describing function explanation for why this hunting behavior might emerge uh, when you start to include uh, friction. And the real 
the message here is the friction nonlinearity looks quite a lot like a relay, and relays are great inducers of limit cycles. Um, you're very welcome to go away and try the describing functions or see what the describing functions for all those other simple um, relay models look like. You can sort of get a bit of a flavor just by guessing, actually, uh, guessing what describing functions look like. So maybe I'll just try and squeeze in an extra picture here. So if you want to guess what a describing function for, let's just say, a nonlinearity that looks like this, a good way to go is just, first of all, imagine that we, we have kind of the small amplitude regime, so inputs to our describing function on a small range, and do the same thing on a large range, and use those to try and plot two points on your describing function curve. Well, so if the amplitude is small, this thing kind of looks like a linear relationship, but with infinite slope. So if we were to model this nonlinearity by a linear function, so we were to replace our relationship. Um, so typically we say the nonlinearity h of y, and let's just give this signal a name here. Let's say it's v. So if we were to replace this, and then we, we say y is equal to a sine omega t. So we're looking for this periodic solution. Um, so if the amplitude is small, this behaves like a linear function, it's approximately equal to ky, where the slope of k is just corresponding to roughly the slope of the nonlinearity you get. And so the slope here is pretty much infinite. So this means that for small amplitudes, the describing function is extremely large. So for small amplitudes, um, so a small n of a is approximately infinity, and similarly, in the, when a is large, your nonlinearity starts to look like a sort of a linear relationship with some slope here, and so for a large, n of a is approximately k, where k is this sort of average uh, slope here. And so now to plot my describing function curve, I just plot the points minus 1 over n of a, and so I'll, my curve will still start at the origin here, and it will still go this way. It won't go all the way to infinity this time, it'll just go to minus uh, 1 over k instead. But that's probably still enough um, to get us to cut through the Nyquist curve and predict a stable limit cycle. So this isn't a feature just of using a relay for a friction model. It's a property that these friction models tend to have extremely high slopes around um, for, for small amplitudes, so they behave like extremely high gains for small amplitudes, and then they're much more benign um, for larger amplitudes. And this means they're describing function curves start at the origin and move to the left, and then you're very likely to end up in this situation where you um, cut through and uh, predict a limit cycle. And if you want to try and design control systems to get around this, one thing you can try to do is tweak your controller here to push the Nyquist curve so that it doesn't um, cut through um, the describing function curve here. So that's sort of a kind of very brief introduction to the phenomena of hunting and how you might go about anal analyzing it with uh, describing function techniques.